there. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, so this video is going to continue our discussion of Module 3, uh, which talks about ethical considerations when conducting psychological research. Uh, so in my last video, I talked about uh, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study and its legacy, not just for the um, participants of the study, but also for um, the broader community and also uh, for the institutions of, of biomedical and behavioral science. Um, so one of the most important legacies of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study is it established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. Okay, um, and that national commission uh, developed something called the Belmont Report. And so the Belmont Report summarizes ethical principles and guidelines for research involving human subjects. Okay, um, and the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research uh, created the requirement that all federally funded universities and research institutions uh, had to follow the Belmont Report. And in order to ensure that the research being conducted follows the ethical guidelines outlined in the Belmont Report, um, there was the establishment of what are called Institutional Review Boards, or IRBs. So basically, before you can conduct any behavioral research or, or biomedical research study, you have to get pre-approval from the Institutional Review Board, which is comprised of uh, various researchers from a number of different disciplines, okay? And that pre-approval uh, is going to ensure that you're following all of the ethical guidelines outlined in this Belmont Report. All right, so in this particular video, I'm going to talk about the ethical guidelines that are outlined in the Belmont Report um, and kind of what they mean, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so there are three ethical principles that are outlined in the Belmont Report. Uh, and the first ethical principle that is outlined um, is the principle of beneficence. Okay? So generally, what does beneficence mean? It means acting with the purpose of benefiting others. Okay? So acting with the purpose of benefiting others. And one of the most important components of the Belmont Principle of Beneficence um, is going to be the cost-benefit analysis. Remember I told you in my first video um, for this module that any ethical dilemma is always going to include um, some consideration of the potential costs and benefits of your decision, right? Um, so in this context, we do a cost-benefit analysis to ensure that our study's potential positive outcomes are going to exceed potentially negative outcomes or risks to participants. Okay? So we want to ensure that our study's potential positive outcomes outweigh any potential negative outcomes or risks to participants, right? So obviously the Tuskegee Syphilis Study uh, represents a, a failure to uphold beneficence um, because there were no benefits to the 400 sharecroppers um, and instead they were faced with um, incalculable uh, risks, um, most notably uh, the risk of death and the risk of passing on this very, very dangerous uh, disease to their, uh, to their offspring as well. Okay. Another consideration we have to make in upholding beneficence is non-malfeasance. 
So non-malfeasance means that researchers should do no harm, right? Just like the oath of Hippocrates, the, Hi the Hippoc uh, Hippocratic oath that all doctors have to abide by, right? Researchers also have to abide by it. Um, so non-malfeasance means that researchers should do no harm. So we must minimize or eliminate potential risks um, to the participants in our study. Okay, so what are the potential risks that we have to eliminate? Um, well, one of those is a loss of confidentiality. So confidentiality involves, um, or a loss of con confidentiality would involve the responses or behaviors of individual participants becoming public knowledge or the focus of public scrutiny. Okay, so assuring participants of, conf of confidentiality means that their responses will not become public knowledge. Okay, um, there's also the potential for, um, oh, before I get to that, I wanted to discuss uh, a study that took place in the uh, in 1970s that represented a profound loss of confidentiality. Uh, so in the 1970s, there was a, a researcher by the name of Humphreys, uh, and he was interested in studying uh, the sexual habits, um, particularly of, of homosexual men. Um, so the work of Humphreys illustrates uh, the priority researchers place on maintaining confidentiality of participants' responses, um, because during the 1960s, Humphreys was a doctoral student in sociology, uh, and he was interested in learning about um, heterosexual men who engaged in homosexual acts in public restrooms. So Humphreys eventually acquired the trust of some of these men who were willing to be interviewed for his study. Right? Given the sensitivity of his research, Humphreys was particularly diligent in protecting the confidentiality of his participants. Right? So for example, he kept the master list of potential participants locked in a safe deposit box um, no names or other identifying information appeared in the questionnaires, and he destroyed all individual interview notes. Okay? Um, Humphreys even allowed police to arrest him rather than revealing um, that he was doing research on this population of men. Okay? But while he might have worked diligently to uh, protect his participants, Humphreys potentially violated participants' privacy in other ways, right? So for example, he used false pretenses to get people to participate, including not revealing that he was a researcher, okay? Um, so clearly that represents a violation of informed consent or a failure to get uh, informed consent, okay? So participants may have revealed private information to him that they would have kept to themselves otherwise, okay? Um, so he certainly wasn't perfect, but he did go to extreme measures to uh, protect his participants' confidentiality, okay? So again, confidentiality or loss of confidentiality would occur if the responses or behaviors of individual participants became public knowledge or the focus of public scrutiny. Another uh, example of potential harm that we have to um, protect our participants from is the loss of anonymity, right? So anonymity involves the pledge that participants' individual responses cannot link back to their personal identity, right? So confidentiality basically says, I will take your identifying characteristics 
okay? And I will record your responses with your identifying information, but I will hide your responses so that they never become public knowledge, okay? Anonymity says your individual responses will never be linked back to your personal identity, right? So your name won't appear on any of the questionnaires or any of the statements that you make, okay? So that theoretically, even if somebody finds the data or finds your questionnaire, they won't know that it came from you, okay? Um, so those are both uh, potential sources of harm, the loss of confidentiality or the loss of anonymity that we have to protect our uh, participants from. Okay. There are other types of harm that we have to protect our participants from. Um, one of those is physical harm. Uh, so it was discovered in uh, the 1940s um, that the US government, as part of their attempts to investigate venereal disease, uh, knowingly infected um, participants in Guatemala as well as uh, individuals at a uh, prison in Indiana with venereal disease to test the efficacy of uh, the drugs that they were developing, okay? So um, individuals in Indiana were uh, knowingly uh, infected with venereal disease um, via prostitutes, um, and individuals in Guatemala were essentially injected um, with, with disease, you know, diseased blood, essentially, um, to, to give them venereal disease. Um, and then these government officials attempted to uh, administer or, or administered the drugs they were developing to see whether they were effective or not, right? So that constitutes a very significant uh, uh, failure to protect physical harm, right? And another example is, of course, the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, where the men were subjected to unimaginable, um, unimaginable harm um, as a result of the untreated syphilis. We also have to be mindful of the potential for psychological harm, right? So as I'll show you guys in just a moment, right, and I'm sure you're already familiar with this, um, studies like the Milgram Obedience Study um, involved significant psychological harm um, as the participants believed that uh, there was a man that they were forced to physically shock or that they physically shocked who was experiencing a significant cardiac event, right? So that experience induced considerable psychological harm. Uh, the participants uh, who enrolled in the Stanford prison study allegedly also experienced um, a lot of psychological harm. Um, that claim has now been disputed um, but at least for some time it was believed that these, uh, these participants experienced significant psychological harm. Uh, and of course, little Albert, who purportedly acquired a fear of uh, the white rat, um, experienced a lot of emotional distress as well. Okay, but in addition to considering the potential types of harm that our research might incur upon participants, we also have to consider the cost of not doing research. So for example, let's suppose um, that you have a very promising theory about the origin of phobias, right? So you have a theory as to how people acquire phobias of things like clowns or snakes or heights, right? But in order to enact your treatment of phobias, you have to temporarily scare participants by presenting them with their phobic object, right? 
but you know that fear response is going to be short-lived, right? Um, do you continue to conduct the study or do you choose to conduct the study or do you not because you don't want to inflict um, that temporary psychological distress, right? Um, in this case, we might say because the potential for harm is, is um, less significant, that the harm of not doing the research outweighs the potential harm of doing the research, right? Especially when we consider that phobias are the most common, commonly experienced psychological disorder. So depression is the most common reasons, the most common reason that people seek treatment for a psychological disorder. Um, but phobias is the most prevalent uh, psychological disorder in the population. Uh, so the benefits that would be incurred by finding a successful treatment for phobias um, would be fairly widespread and significant. And maybe that significant benefit outweighs the temporary cost of the, of the short-lived fear response that your participants might experience. Okay, so again, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, but just to review, um, Stanley Milgram and his obedience experiment, um, he told, um, Vol the volunteers that he recruited or his participants were told to teach another person that was actually a confederate or an accomplice in the experiment word pairs by applying an electric shock every time the learner was wrong and of course the learner was just a recording um, and not an actual person uh, the learner also told the volunteer that he had a heart condition okay um, so the objective of the study was to see how uh, strong of a shock or um, participants would be willing to uh, administer. And 65% 60 of the teachers um, or the participants obeyed the experimenter's commands to continue. Um, and they did so despite the learner's earlier mention of a heart condition and despite hearing cries of protest after they administered the shocks. Um, and most, 65% um, of um, participants went all the way up to the maximum shock. Okay. Um, so what are the ethical considerations of the study? Primarily, the degree of emotional distress that this experience um, uh, caused the participants. Um, so these were direct uh, excerpts from uh, Milgram's article um, detailing the, uh, the results of this study. So it says, in a large number of cases, the degree of tension reached extremes that are rarely seen in the socio-psychological -psycho laboratory. Uh, participants were observed to sweat, tremble, stutter, bite their lips, groan, and dig their fingernails into the flesh. Observed regular occurrence of nervous laughter. Um, a full-blown seizure was observed for three participants, and one man had a seizure that was so violently convulsive that it was necessary to halt the experiment. Okay? So without question, during the experiment, um, individual participants experienced a, a, a pretty much the maximal degree of emotional distress at the prospect of, of potentially injuring um, this, this confederate, right? Who they believe to be an actual participant. Uh, so this was a response to uh, Milgram's study, and it says, I do regard the emotional disturbance described by Milgram as potentially harmful because it could easily affect an alternation in the part, um, alternation in the, in the participant's self-image or ability to trust authorities in the future, right? So not only uh, 
do participants experience significant distress during the experiment? Um, but similar to the outcome of the Tuskegee syphilis study, right? Having a situation where uh, an authority figure um, ex evokes this kind of emotional distress and psychological harm uh, could fundamentally change um, the way that you view uh, research in the future and authority figures in the future. Um, and it could also lead to uh, low self-esteem or uh, feelings of self-hatred, knowing that you proceeded all the way to the highest possible shock. Okay, so again, participants experienced these high levels of distress um, because they trusted the experimenter as an authority figure and in many ways they wanted to please the experimenter. Um, and for many of them, that desire was uh, overwhelming and superseded everything else, right? Um, and they were also significantly worried about um, the victim, who again alleged to have a heart condition, um, which could be potentially negatively impacted, one would think, um, by the administration of these shocks, okay? Uh, and perhaps most harmful, right, is we expect that scientists and people put in positions of authority would do everything they can to uh, protect the participant and make sure that when they leave the lab, they are in a positive psychological state um, and not uh, in a more negative and potentially harmful state um, than they were when they arrived, right? And some of the most commonly experienced uh, emotions that um, participants in Milgram study reported as they felt humiliated, uh, alienated, hostile, and insecure um, when the when the experiment ended. Okay. Um, so the second Belmont principle um, that we are all required to follow is the principle of justice. So what does justice mean? Justice in this context refers to fairness in selecting study participants and in determining which participants receive the benefits of participation and which participants bear the burden of the risk, right? So for example, uh, with the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, the, par the 400 participants, right, because they were never told they had syphilis and they never received any treatment for the progression of the, of the syphilis, right, they were unduly uh, forced to uh, bear the entire entirety of the burden. Um, and because they weren't given any kind of treatment, right, they weren't given any of the benefits, okay? So they were responsible for bearing all of the costs or the burdens of the research um, without any of the benefits, right? So this represents a, a egregious failure to abide by the principle of justice, okay? Similarly, with uh, the 1939 uh, Wendell Johnson study where um, where uh, um, children were basically emotionally abused with the uh, illicit objective of making them into stutterers, right? This is an example of a failure of justice because the children were orphans, right? Um, so they didn't have uh, any parents or any advocates to look out for for their best interest and protect them from the uh, costs of the study. Um, and again, just like the participants in the Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, they bore all of the burdens or risks um, with none of the potential benefits. Okay. So here's an example of a potential ethical dilemma that relates to justice. 
So as a therapist, you have developed a potential treatment for severe depression and suicidal ideation. To test it, you randomly assign uh, patients to the treatment or no treatment condition. After you run your test with a few participants, it is clear that your treatment is highly effective. Okay. So given this knowledge, how would you proceed, okay, with an understanding that you're required to uphold justice, okay? So again, justice is fairness in selecting study participants and in determining uh, which participants receive the benefits and which participants bear the burden of the risk. So the most ethical uh, uh, resolution um, for this particular dilemma uh, is not to deprive one group um, of the effective treatment, okay? So an, uh, one way that you could do this is by exposing both treatment groups to the effective treatment, right? So for example, you could start without treatment, okay? So all participants enrolled in the study have no treatment for depression for say six weeks, and then you log their depression scores, right? And then for another six weeks, all participants are given the treatment, right? So you still have the ability to compare the treatment and no treatment conditions, okay? Uh, but you don't deprive any of your participants of the treatment, right? So that would be an example of how we might uphold um, the principle of justice. Alrighty, so our third ethical principle, or Belmont principle, uh, is respect for persons. And essentially what that respect for persons uh, means is it highlights the importance of autonomy. So it's essentially the idea that people are capable of making deliberate informed decisions about their participation in research, okay? People are capable of making deliberate informed decisions about their participation in research. So in essence, what that means is that people should have the right to freely choose whether they want to take part in a particular study or not. So the primary vehicle that we use to uphold autonomy or respect for persons is informed consent. So informed consent is part of the standard ethical procedures at the beginning of a research study uh, in which the participant learns what the study expects of them, the risks and benefits of participating, um, and then they freely make a choice about whether they want to participate in the study or not. So let's look at the individual components of an informed consent um, a little bit closer. So again, the informed consent is typically a, uh, a document that is presented to a prospective participant um, basically as soon as they walk through the door and they read this document and if they agree to participate in the study, they sign it and give it back to the experimenter. Um, so the first part of any informed consent document is going to explain the general purpose of this study, right? So for example, this study investigates uh, the effect of uh, music, listening to music on uh, memory, future memory for uh, a deck of playing cards or something like that, or this, this study investigates uh, the effect of uh, um, altruism on uh, social distancing compliance or something like that, right? So it, just in a few short sentences, it tells the participant what the researcher is investigating, 
Um, one of the most important components of the informed consent form, okay, is that it communicates to participants that their participation is 100% voluntary um, and that they are free to withdraw from the study at any time if they choose to. And specifically, it says that if they choose to terminate their participation, they will still receive uh, whatever compensation they've been offered, right? So if you choose to leave for any reason, for example, you will still receive your participation credits if you're an intro psych student, or you will still receive your $10 gift card if you're participating for money, and so forth, right? So it stipulates that your participation is voluntary and that you will not be uh, uh, deprived of your, of your compensation for uh, choosing to, to end the study. Okay. It also uh, indicates any potential risks that uh, you might experience, right? So if you're uh, involved in a uh, investigation of an antidepressant drug, for example, or uh, maybe if you have a very uh, serious and rare form of cancer, if they give you um, a new chemotherapy drug or what have you, uh, this is where they would apprise you of any potential side effects of the medication. Um, that, that, that you might be at risk for. Um, and even in behavioral research studies, if, if um, there's a potential for you to experience some anxiety or, or stress as a result of your participation, um, that should be clearly communicated in the informed consent form. Okay, you're also going to be told about the potential benefits, right? So those benefits might be, you know, Psych 101 credit, the $10 gift card, um, but also more broadly, um, the benefits of the research, right? So I investigate learning and memory, human learning and memory, um, and a lot of my research has direct implications, um, for example, for educators and also for students. So I point out in a lot of my informed consent forms um, that they could, uh, as a result of their participation, learn about a groundbreaking uh, study technique um, that, that might prove beneficial to them. Or they might just improve their knowledge of memory or of psychological research or what have you, right? So you want to communicate um, the benefits um, that might result from uh, the, the um from the from this this particular study. All right. So in addition to um, to everything we just talked about under autonomy or respect for persons, um, you also want to make sure that your consent form um, is jargon free uh, and that it can be read by someone with an eighth grade reading level. Okay. Um, and that's just part of making sure that people have enough information to make an informed decision um, and that they themselves can, de again, decide whether they want to participate or not. Uh, and the final component of um, respect for persons um, is we also want to have a special consideration uh, for participants who might be uh, younger than 18. So if you're younger than 18, you actually cannot provide informed consent. And instead, you need an assent form. And essentially what an assent form is, it's a document that your uh, parental guardian um, would sign um, that basically indicates your wish to participate, okay? So it's an active affirmation of a desire to participate that acknowledges at least legally that the participant is not capable of providing his or her own informed consent, okay? So your parents or legal guardian signs it, basically giving your assent 
or willingness um, to participate because you yourself are not old enough to give informed consent. Okay, um, so here on this slide, I have got a summary table for you uh, with the three principles, the three Belmont principles of ethical research. Um, so again, we have beneficence, which involves actively promoting the welfare of others. Um, and it's an ethical obligation to maximize benefits in research studies while minimizing risk, okay? We have uh, justice, which is fairness in selecting study participants and in determining which participants receive um, the benefits of participation and which bear the burden of the risk, okay? Um, and one additional note that I do want to make under the uh, Belmont principle of justice, okay, um, is that part of the justice principle um, is making sure that we are not using uh, vulnerable populations, okay? And particularly that those vulnerable populations are not being given all of the risks or burdened with all of the risks, right? So this is something we saw in the Tuskegee syphilis study with the 400 illiterate sharecroppers Okay, um, they were particularly vulnerable um, for a number of reasons, their socioeconomic status, um, the fact that they were illiterate, the fact that they couldn't afford medical care and so on. Um, the Wendell Johnson uh, stuttering study, um, that population uh, incurred all of the risks and none of the benefits. Um, partially because they were vulnerable, because they were orphans, um, they didn't have parents or guardians to advocate uh, for their own interests, um, and so therefore they were uh, they were kind of forced to participate in this study. Um, and lastly, we have prison populations, right? So in the Holmesburg study, uh, where the uh, inmates were uh, given compensation, right? Um, so these men were given literally hundreds of dollars to expose themselves to um, toxic materials and mind-altering drugs and unsafe products, right? Um, but essentially, they were coerced, right? Um, because these men were severely economically disadvantaged and did not have the option as inmates to uh, get actual, you know, vocations. Um, so the prospect of getting hundreds of dollars uh, was so irresistible or so compelling um, that they were willing to incur the burdens of all of these risks for the benefit of financial compensation, right? So we would consider all of these examples violations of justice because vulnerable populations uh, were placed in a position where they were forced to suffer all of the negative consequences with, with none or little of the positive consequences of the research, okay? And lastly, like we just talked about, we have the principle of autonomy or respect for persons in which we acknowledge that participants can freely choose whether they want to participate in, in, in uh, research after being given adequate information, okay? All right, so one last thing I wanna talk about is deception in psychological research. So deception in this context means purposefully misleading um, participants for the purpose of research, right? So we see this in, uh, particularly in uh, Stanley Milgram's obedience study, um, but it's also very common in other types of uh, social psychological research or other examples of social psych research, okay? Um, and in fact, it's often uh, necessary in order to study the particular constructs um, that we're interested in. 
So certainly there are cases where deception is totally um, permissible or allowed under the Belmont principles. Um, the only thing we have to be mindful of is making sure that that deception um, doesn't cause significant psychological distress, right? So we always want to minimize as much as possible the potential for participants to experience psychological harm or distress. Okay, um, and one of the best ways to do that is to use what we call debriefing uh, procedures. So debriefing procedures, I'm sure for those of you who have participated uh, in psychological studies as an as a, as a intro student, um, is essentially where uh, the researcher explains the purpose of the study, um, what they, that they've been investigating, um, and also, of course, they would reveal any uh, deception that they might have used throughout the course of the experiment. Um, and one of the primary goals of a debriefing procedure um, in direct consequence to Milgram's study is to make sure that participants return to their original emotional state after the study is over. Right? So if you've evoked any kind of psychological distress or if you have intentionally put your participants in a negative mood state um, to assess the consequences of that mood state, um, you would want to make sure to return participants to their original state before uh, allowing them to leave the study. Again, IRBs. Every uh, institution that receives federal funding and conducts research must have an institutional review board. Uh, so the committees review proposals of research and evaluate whether they adhere to the Belmont principles or not. Um, and it's usually comprised of a variety of faculty and staff at institutions who have expertise in research, um, but they could also include members of the community. So for example, uh, clergy members. Um, and there are different uh, classifications uh, that the IRB uh, uses when evaluating research, okay? Uh, so if your research poses less than minimal risk, okay? So if there are no known risks of um, physical or psychological harm, um, and it doesn't include a vulnerable population, um, typically that would be classified as exempt, and it's only going to be reviewed by the chair of the IRB, okay? Uh, if your research poses minimal risk, and minimal risk is defined as uh, risks that you would normally encounter in your everyday life, okay? So this can include uh, minor stress, uh, moderate exercise, completion of testing or surveys. And again, um, you're utilizing a non-vulnerable population, then that would get an expedited uh, classification and it would be reviewed by the chair and another member of the IRB committee, okay? And lastly, we have a full review. So if your research poses a greater than minimal risk, okay, um, and you're using a vulnerable population, and we define a vulnerable population as mentally disabled persons, children, uh, elderly, prisoners, pregnant women, people of that sort, um, then you're going to get a full review, which means you're reviewed by the IRB committee um, of at least five members of the IRB committee, right? So the exact process um, that you go through depends upon what your population is, whether it's vulnerable or non-vulnerable, um, and also the amount of risk that you expect participants to incur as a result of your study. Okay, um, so finally I wanted to talk about um, how we ensure that animal research is abiding by ethical principles as well. 
Um, so just like we have the IRB for uh, human uh, participants, we have the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee for animal participants, okay? But one of the primary differences between human and animal research, obviously, um, is that animals are not capable of providing informed consent, right? Um, so one of the primary responsibilities of this committee um, is going to make sure um, that the general needs of the animals are met. Um, so obviously they're given food, um, access to clean, comfortable housing conditions, um, or a, you know, a generally healthy environment. Um, they have medicine if they need it, um, and access to food, um, at least more often than not. Sometimes we do uh, withhold food from animals temporarily, um, but in general, they, in, unless it's part of the research, they should have access to food, water, things like that. Um, and like I said, there are a lot of advantages of, of um, animals over humans. Um, but one of the primary disadvantages is that you can, is that they can't provide um, informed consent, right? Um, so that's something to be mindful of as well. Uh, and so some of the benefits that scientists might incur um, by focusing on animals um, is that you can alter the genetics of animals um, such that they're all going to be genetically identical. Uh, you have complete control of the experiences of the animals 24-7, um, and you also have access to data 24 hours a day, right? So you have animals that are genetically identical, uh, you have complete control over their environment and experiences, and you have access to data 24 hours a day, right? So those are a lot of potential benefits um, as opposed to human research where you only have access to uh, your participants for usually about an hour or two. Okay? All right, so that concludes my discussion of ethical principles and the Belmont Report. Um, so I apologize this was a little bit longer than some of my other videos, um, but hopefully you found it informative. And certainly if you have any questions, please let me know. And I will see you in my next video.